Hi, so I'm not like the others. I'm not an internist. I'm not a hematologist. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. So be careful what you ask me. Uh, uh, but I am going to talk about women and blood clots because I do care for women. How many of you are a woman? <laughs> How many of you have a daughter or a sister whom? Uh, well, why, why talk about women uh, and their unique issues? Are women more likely to have blood clots? In fact, not. We heard from Dr. Ansel that men, in fact, are more likely to have blood clots. We saw those two curves that he presented in one of his slides. Then why single women out? Well, I think we've gotten the picture. Women have some unique challenges. We heard some stories about pregnancy. We heard some stories about birth control pills. And maybe if we heard from one more patient, we would have heard some unique situations about hormone replacement therapy. So there's some circumstances and some life challenges that affect women that are unique around hormones and pregnancy that increase the risk of blood clots. So we'll ask uh, three questions and we'll respond to them. Does pregnancy cause blood clots? Do birth control pills cause blood clots? Does hormone replacement cause blood clots? And how do we respond to those three situations? Well, does pregnancy cause blood clots? Well, one to two per thousand women have blood clots with pregnancy. And the risk of clots increases fourfold during pregnancy. So it's a risk factor, but not necessarily a cause. Uh, the risk of clots increases 20, at least 20-fold after delivery, maybe up to 80-fold. And in that first week after delivery, the risk is up to 100-fold. And this tendency to form clots is actually protection against hemorrhage. So why are women more likely to clot? Well, women have evolved so that they are have some inherent protection against blood clots that protects them at the time of childbirth. And this inherent protection actually forms during pregnancy as early as the first six to eight weeks after pregnancy in case they would miscarry. So there's this inherent response in women uh, probably due to clotting factor proteins that protects them from the bleeding challenges of miscarriage and childbirth. Now, birth control pills, uh, patches, rings, and the hormonal contraceptives that we use are manufactured from hormones that are pregnancy hormones. They are used to make the body think it's a little bit pregnant. And, and as a consequence, it, we can use that to prevent pregnancy but they also carry the side effect of an increased tendency to form clots. So where do these blood clots occur? Well, unlike in older individuals where most of the blood clots occur in arteries, in young people who have healthy arteries, 80% of these blood clots occur in veins. And we heard that blood clots in veins can travel to the lung. 75% of the blood clots that occur in young, healthy women of childbearing age, whether that's in pregnancy or outside of pregnancy, occur in the deep veins. And 25% travel to the lungs. So if a woman has had a blood clot before, and wants to become pregnant or becomes pregnant, those women have a one to 2% risk of having a blood clot each year, but that risk increases to five to 10% during pregnancy if they're untreated, but if they use anticoagulation, they can knock that risk down to 1% and they can equalize their risk to the risk that they had uh, before they became pregnant. So they may have come off of blood thinners uh, after they had a clot, maybe in, because they were used in association with birth control pills or some other circumstance, but now that they want to become pregnant, they're at an increased risk. So how do they compensate for that? Well, 
they need to go back on blood thinners. Thrombophilia, or an increased tendency to form clots, uh, can be either inherited or acquired. We heard terms like the factor V Leiden today. We heard terms like the factor II mutation or prothrombin gene mutation. Those are inherited tendencies to form clots. And on our last panel, we heard two speakers had the anaphospholipid syndrome. That's an acquired tendency to form clots. Uh, it makes very little difference sort of how it came to being because the end result is a tendency to form clots and that tendency needs to be dealt with. So uh, who needs anticoagulation during pregnancy? Well, uh, women whose risk of clots is more than the risk of bleeding with anticoagulants and that anticoagulants are not a free ride. We heard about the increased risk of bleeding with anticoagulants and it's about one to two percent uh, with pregnancy. So we also want any woman who's already on anticoagulants to stay on anticoagulants. So one of, uh, one of the things that we see in our clinic is women are here through the media that any medication is bad through preg in pregnancy. So one of the first things they do when they become pregnant, even if they're on a life-saving blood thinner, is to stop their medication, stop all their medication, and that may include blood thinners. Well, maybe that's not a bad idea if it's warfarin because, as we'll talk about later, warfarin's not good for pregnancy, but they do need to be on some protection against um, blood clots. Other women who need to be on anticoagulation are most women who have had a blood clot in the past but are not currently on anticoagulants. And women with thrombophilia, like the anaphospholipid syndrome, or maybe some inherited thrombophilias who have had a clot in the past or have had bad pregnancy outcomes like recurrent miscarriages or a stillbirth. I alluded to the fact that maybe it's not a bad idea if they come off of warfarin. Well, why is warfarin unsafe during pregnancy? It's a small molecule and it can cross the placenta into the fetal circulation. And warfarin increases the risk of birth defects and even after that critical period where the baby is formed in the first trimester of pregnancy, it can cause bleeding in the fetus and uh, so it is contraindicated is the medical term we use during pregnancy. Even the new oral anticoagulants, which may not carry the same risk, are still small molecules and we do not use them in pregnancy. But heparins, which unfortunately have to be injected, either the intravenous or unfractionated heparin, the standard heparin, or the low molecular weight heparins like anoxaparin, uh, which is the uh, generic form of Lovenox, are large molecules. They do not cross the placenta, and we can use heparin safely in pregnancy. Not only do they not cross the placenta, and can we, we can use them safely to treat the mother, but they probably use reduce the uh, risk of bad outcomes. We have plenty of data to that effect. By improving the maternal circulation to the placenta and improving blood flow to the baby. So how do we prevent or treat blood clots during pregnancy? Usually with twice daily injections of low molecular weight heparin and with or without conversion to standard unfractionated heparin around delivery. And why would we convert to standard unfractionated heparin around delivery? Because it's shorter acting and it clears from the circulation more quickly and it gives women more options about what anesthetic they can have. The most popular form of medication for prevention of pain now around the time of delivery is the epidural anesthetic, which requires an injection into the space around the spine, and anesthesiologists do not want to administer that to anybody who has a long-acting anticoagulant in their circulation. So what 
precautions are taking at delivery. We want to hold the heparin around the time of delivery to reduce the risk of bleeding to allow the opportunity for an epidural or a spinal. So we substitute those pneumatic compression devices uh, that you saw in pictures earlier. And what about after delivery, that highest risk period? Well, we want to get the anticoagulation restarted uh, and we want women to stay on it for that that highest risk period for blood clotting, that six weeks or so after delivery. Now, women who are going to be on lifelong go back on anticoagulation because they're on anticoagulation lifelong. They can go back on their warfarin when their risk of bleeding around childbirth is reduced. Now, the good news for women who plan to breastfeed is neither low molecular weight heparin or even warfarin are, uh, are contraindicated in breastfeeding. Breastfeeding uh, this is okay for women who are either taking low molecular weight heparin or warfarin. We just don't know about these new oral anticoagulants whether breastfeeding is a safe thing to do while a woman is on these new oral anticoagulants. Now, uh, one of the questions, though, is uh, do birth control pills cause blood clots? Well, birth control pills per se don't cause blood clots, but they are a risk factor for blood clots. Well, why? Birth control pills with estrogen increase the risk of a blood clot about threefold. So a woman taking birth control pills has about a 1 in 300 risk of having a blood clot each year. That's not a real high risk. I mean, they aren't, that's not a high enough, they aren't good enough odds that you would bet a lot of money in Las Vegas on it. The patches, the birth control patches and rings double the risk over pills. And some pills carry a higher risk than other pills. You may have heard in the news about the Yaz birth control pills. They carry about the same risk as the patches and rings. We used to think that the birth control injections, the shots, uh, the depomedroxyprogesterone acetate, otherwise known as Depo-Provera injections, we thought that they were completely safe to use in women with a history of blood clots. Well, now with some more studies, maybe they may slightly increase the risk of blood clots. They may increase the risk of blood clots up to twofold. So in women who aren't already on a blood thinner, maybe that's not a pass. And the risk of blood clots is much higher in women who have thrombophilia, a known risk factor for blood clots, or have a history of clots unless they are already on anticoagulation. So we don't want to provoke blood clots in women who have risk factors like a history of blood clots or thrombophilia by prescribing hormonal birth control that has estrogen uh, unless they are already on anticoagulants. Now one of the things that frosts me is a woman who comes in pregnant and says, I was told I couldn't use any birth control because I've had a blood clot. Well, there are plenty of safe alternatives to women can have their families when they want to have their families because there are other safe methods of birth control if a woman has had blood clots or has thrombophilia. Not the methods that were on the previous slide, but there are alternatives. There are the classic barrier methods like the diaphragm. There are spermicides, the foams, jellies uh, that can be bought at the drugstore. There are, there is the copper intrauterine device. There is surgical sterilization like tubal ligation and vasectomy. There are progesterone only pills, the progesterone only intrauterine device, and the progestin implant. And then other hormonal birth control is an option 
perhaps if a woman is on anticoagulation. Now, one of the questions that I get is what if, what if I'm using anticoagulation and I start having heavy periods and the only ways my doctor uh, can manage it is with um, hormones. Well, in that situation, it may be possible to use certain birth control pills, patches, and rings. Um, the levonorgestrel intrauterine device, however, may be a safer alternative, as is progestin injections, the progestin implant. And then there's, if a woman ha is choosing to have no more children, the lining of the uterus may be able to be destroyed through a procedure called endometrial ablation. And all of those may be options before a hysterectomy. And then a, a little known complication of a lifetime on anticoagulation is bleeding at the time of ovulation. Each time a woman during her childbearing years releases an egg, there may be a little bit of bleeding at the site where the egg is released. Now, in a woman who's not on anticoagulation and doesn't have a bleeding disorder, that may not result in any significant bleeding whatsoever. But in a woman who's on anticoagulation, that may lead to more than a trivial amount of bleeding. And combined hormonal birth control pills, injections and implants can actually prevent that type of hemorrhage. Our progestin-only pills and IUD don't. So that's a consideration when we're trying to manage women who have had not only heavy bleeding, but had hemorrhages from their ovaries and are on anticoagulants. Now the other question I said we'd talk about is does postmenopausal hormone therapy cause blood clots? And again, it doesn't cause blood clots, but it's a risk factor. Hormonal therapy increases the risk two to three fold. And again, the absolute risk is one in 300 per year. And again, the risk is much higher in women with thrombophilia or of a history of clots unless they're on anticoagulation. So while we were on break, I was asked these very questions out in the hallway. Well, what if I have postmenopausal symptoms? What can I do to manage these postmenopausal symptoms if I've had a blood clot or I have thrombophilia? Well, estrogen, or, um, estrogen and progesterone may be okay depending on the severity of the coagulation situation if you're on anticoagulation. Otherwise, we would recommend relief for specific symptoms. And that may be specific therapy for those symptoms which may include mood changes, hot flashes, or hot flushes as they're called across the ocean, vaginal dryness, or sleeplessness. Now, for mood changes, and these may affect men during menopause, too. <laughs> <laughs> Counseling and support. And then uh, the category of antidepressants called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors have been effective not only in treating mood changes, but also, as you'll see on the next slide or two, in treating hot flashes, and also the category called selective norepinephrine inhibitors. Um, a reuptake inhibitors have also been effective. But also, there are non-pharmacologic treatments like keeping the core body temperature as cool as possible, dressing in layers, using a fan. For those of us in the room who have been through this, sleep in a cool room, drink ice water, refrain from smoking, exercising regularly, practicing relaxation techniques, don't let your boss get you upset, avoid perceived hot flash triggers like hot drinks, caffeine, spicy foods, alcohol, emotional reactions, and anticipating that uh, it usually takes about six months to get through the worst of it. Some people have to endure this forever, but the worst is usually about six months. 
Non-prescription remedies that some of our patients with hot flashes seek, such as soy, vitamin E, donquagen, seeing evening primrose oil and red clover, have not been found to be effective. But there are studies that show that there are some non-hormonal treatments that do not increase the risk of blood clots that have been found to be significantly effective in uh, medical studies, and they include the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, that's paroxetine, fluoxetine, sertraline, citalopram, um, and that's the Prozac family of drugs. And then uh, the selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, venloxetine, um, et cetera. So uh, your uh, doctor may be able to prescribe one of these uh, instead of estrogen or estrogen and progestin. And gabapentin, um, which started as a seizure medication, has also been shown to reduce hot flashes. Uh, the other big complaint is vaginal atrophy, meaning thinning in the lining of the vagina and dryness. Uh, lubricants are temporary. Uh, measures to reduce vaginal dryness, like KY jelly and vaginal moisturizers are, uh, provide long-term uh, relief and are like replens, and they can be purchased over the counter uh, in the drugstore. But we have more and more data that topical estrogen, estrogen applied directly to the vagina in the form of tablets, rings, and low doses of cream have very little systemic absorption, and we're beginning to use that in select cases of women with a history of breast cancer or thrombosis to restore uh, the lining of the vagina to its premenopausal state. And then there's the sleeplessness. Um, so that the top there is melatonin, uh, the middle one that is um, Ambien, the bottom is Sonata. Uh, these are specific medications, one's over the counter, the last two are uh, prescription. The last two should only be used for short term, but they may be able to help in that early uh, perimenopausal period when the sleeplessness sets in uh, to help make that transition through that sleepless period during menopause. And hormones could be avoided. And if that doesn't work, you can always go to Australia. I heard that several times during a couple of the early talks and count sheep. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. I think we have time for questions. Do you have questions? Um, I have a question about the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Um, is it, um, you had said that there are, it's not necessarily genetic and there could be um, uh, causes for it. Do you have anything you can speak to on that? So the question, if you didn't hear it in the back, was uh, the antiphospholipid syndrome. It's not necessarily genetic. It's not her inherited in a traditional genetic way. It, we think it's acquired. Uh, however, there are tendencies for it to run in families. There's factors that may allow it to um, be more likely to occur in certain families than the others, but it's not passed on directly in a genetic way from one person to the other, like say the factor V Leiden or the prothrombin gene. Uh, it, but we see it run, tend to run in families, like we see lupus or rheumatoid arthritis tend to run in families. We see an increased tendency, but it is not directly passed on like other genetic conditions. Probably we see the risk um, increase maybe uh, several fold and maybe four to five percent of family members may 
have it, but not it's not directly passed on. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, I was just wondering if it's not if it's not directly passed on. Do you, have, is there any findings on why a person actually has it? Not there are not factors on exactly why one person in the family gets it as opposed to why another person in the fa family doesn't. I think that our moderator, I think there's here, here, and then one in the front. Um, also on the antiphospholipid syndrome, you mentioned um, when women are giving birth, they stop the Coumadin prior, and, or when you're pregnant, obviously stop it prior, and then the heparin shots, um, and then they stop that during delivery. Is there a risk for somebody with antiphospholipid when they're on nothing except for the, the compression socks? Or? Yes, but we're talking about a very short period. We're talking about 24 hours. Uh, we're talking about 24 hours before the planned delivery, and then we're talking about restarting the anticoagulation 12 to 24 hours after the delivery. So we're talking about a very narrow window. And yes, have I actually seen blood clots occur during that period? Yes, but the but we're balancing that, like we've heard in other situations, against the very real risk of bleeding because the woman's giving birth. But the risk is low when the period off of anticoagulation is very short. What do we do during that period of time to reduce the risk? We have women who are, if women have antiphospholipid syndrome, in most cases they're also continuously on a low-dose aspirin. So we have that in the background, and that's safe to continue through childbirth. So they have that in the background and we have the pneumatic compression devices in place. Thank you. Uh, Dr. James, thank you very much. I'm on hormone replacement therapy because I have lichen sclerosis, which has severely caused vaginal atrophy in the vovular region. And I'm wondering if there's some testing that I should have done uh, in terms of my risk for uh, blood clots, and any particular recommendations for treating the vaginal atrophy? So um, the, the question is, should a woman, and I'm going to ask it generally rather right. than specifically, should a woman, and what I'm going to infer is you have no other particular risk factors, right. um, and you're taking a topical vaginal therapy to treat a vaginal, a, atrophy condition? And the answer is no. We generally do not recommend if a woman has no um, risk factors, no personal risk factors for a blood clot um, and has never, never had a blood clot, has no known thrombophilic risk factors and needs to be treated for vaginal atrophy with a topical um, uh, estrogen preparation does not need to be tested. The risk for clots from that very little topical preparation is very low and we would not discourage her from using it. So that's the general answer to that question. Of course, always talk it over individually with your doctor and make sure that you've had your medical history reviewed and et cetera. But the general answer to that question is what I just gave you. And then there's a question back here. Um, someone with a history of clotting um, that has fertility issues, would there be treatments that you recommend to take or avoid? Um, so the, the question is, are, are there, do we have to take, I'm, I'm going to answer it this way, or I'm going to rephrase the question this way. Is there, do we have to tailor um, infertility treatment or fertility treatments to somebody who has a history of thrombosis? Is that? Like taking like Clomid, is that some safe or would you recommend a different alternative? So. Um, so Clomid is a generally a low risk. Clomid approximately doubles the risk of blood clots. Um, so it's about the risk of birth control pills. So depending on what a person's blood clotting risk or blood clotting history is, we may need to make some adjustments in whatever their uh, whatever preventative therapy we are doing 
if we're going to prescribe Clomid. So if we think doubling the risk of their having a blood clot um, would be significant, we may need to put them on a blood thinner around Clomid treatment. If we don't think that would significantly increase their risk, we won't. Um, if we have a person who's had a history of blood clots and we are going to use the injectable blood thinners, or excuse me, the injectable um, ovulation inducing agents, um, we're going to use one of those protocols that ha carries a much higher risk for blood clots because of the risk of serious ovarian stimulation. We will almost always uh, use a blood thinner around that, use low molecular weight heparin around that. Um, and then if we're going to retrieve an egg, uh, we will hold the blood thinner for 24 hours and restart it 24 hours afterwards. But, and then there are now some protocols that we use around the infertility treatment that don't require as much ovarian stimulation as others um, with um, letrozole instead of um, the, uh, the old, the, uh, the other gonadotropin. So, in fact, the answer to your question is yes. We may make some modifications, we meaning us who advise our infertility specialists, we may make some modifications in the protocol that we use for women with a history of thrombosis to reduce their risk, and we may also prescribe some anticoagulants, um, and then we, then we will hold the anticoagulant before and after an egg retrieval if we're going to do the um, harvest the egg. So is that it? I want to thank Dr. James so much once again.